G. Marshall. If your blood runs cold at specters rising from the moss-grown grave, or bloody murder of the innocent, while the evil and the damned hold sway, now is the time to leave. All right, if you prefer to stay, come with me now to the strange and forbidding house that fades and reappears strangely in the mists of the moors where it is situated. The house of Cadmus Melchior, where the handsome Baron Mark Staunton is making a request which sounds more like a command. I want Melinda. Must you invade my privacy? This laboratory is open to no one but me. I am... I was your son-in-law. I have the right. I cannot live without your daughter. Melinda has been dead for seven years. But you can raise her from the grave. Uh, You must! Uh... It's true, I believe I am very close at last to the elixir of life. Then in God's name use it to bring Melinda back to me. No, not yet. Not yet. You were so close to death yourself, what are you afraid of? My fear is more for you. I warn you, my son. I warn you. Do not try to wake the dead. Our mystery drama, The Spectral Bride, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Wager and Joan Loring. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I warn you, do not try to wake the dead. And yet, who among us who truly believed that some power could restore a loved one could be strong enough to resist the temptation? Let us remember, too, that in other days, an alchemist was a man accorded most infinite respect. Quite apart from his search to transmute baser metal to gold, his basic interest was his humanistic effort to produce the cure-all, the elixir of life, which would alleviate and end all human pain. To a man like Baron Mark Staunton, the alchemist was a figure of total respect, almost adulation. And uh, as for his daughter, Melinda... (laughs) But uh, Mark can talk about her better than I. Oh, that's a handsome filly. A little short in the leg, I'd say. Beneath that billowing skirt, how can you see? Oh, not the horse, cousin, the lady. Look at that. Take that wall. Beautiful. Oh, I'll grant you the lady has a firm hand and an admirable seat. But she's a wild one and highly selective. Ah, so you've made your own advances and gotten your knuckles whacked? Cousin Mark, if I didn't have a natural fondness for you, I could resent that. Particularly since it's true. But it goes a little deeper than that. How so? I am scarcely a man to be ridden by superstition. I distrust all philosophers, dreamers, astrologers, and most of all, the alchemist. All right, I won't argue, but... Must the alchemist's daughter pattern herself on what her father thinks? I couldn't figure out what the alchemist's daughter thinks or believes. She is too much for me. And like a good soldier, I know when to retreat and when to accept defeat. But how am I to find out what she thinks or believes? Or what she's like? That's simple enough. I may not have measured up, but I am still welcome at their home. Can you take me there? Soon? When? I don't know why I retain any family fondness for you. Your insistence on not going home without a bag full of grouse has kept us so late. The afternoon mists are already clouding the moor. It might be best to ride to Mantra Manor till they blow away with the setting sun. Mantra Manor? The center of your heart's desire. 
If Professor Cadmus Melchior is out of his laboratory and in a good mood, we may even enjoy some good mulled wine. What about his daughter? Shall we meet her? That will be strictly up to the lady who has a mind of her own. Does she also have a name? <laughs> her name is Melinda. But if you'll forgive some friendly advice, she's as hard to gentle as your own stallion was. Melinda. Not the way the name sounds. What's in a name? But if it's your wish... It's more than my wish. I know it as well as my name. Let go! <laughs> The alchemist was a tall, cadaverous man with piercing green eyes that gleamed like emeralds from the shadows beneath great, tufted brows. But my own eyes had little time to spend on him. Instead, they followed Melinda as though controlled not by me, but by the spell of her presence. She had changed to a long, white, silken robe which clung to her body. Her face was impassive, but the long raven hair danced in curls against the white of her dress and her skin. And her eyes, so dark brown as to be nearly black, shone with excitement and mystery. You picked a fortunate hour, Baron Hayward, to visit with me again. Just at the evening meal, you and your friend will join me. After a day's hard riding, I would be honored to accept your invitation. And your friend? Mark? Mark! What? We have been invited to share the doctor's meal. Most gracious of you, Dr. Cadmus. First, some wine. Melinda? Bruce. Thank you, Melinda. Sir? From your hand, even wormwood and gall. <laughs> I trust you will find my wine more to your palate than that. Sire. Thank you, daughter. You may leave us alone now. I could have killed him cheerfully. Naturally, I thought Melinda would be joining us. Here I was, already hopelessly in love, and instead of being able to feed my eyes on her, I... Had to face some strange gelatinous potion ladled from a steaming pot onto my plate. When Bruce first came calling, he used to look on these potpourris of mine as if they contained newt's eyes, bat wool, and dog's tongues. <laughs> I assure you, it is naught but the best of venison, flavored with some condiments my daughter and I favor. I've never tasted better. I speak for the wine also. Your taste, doctor, is impeccable in all things. But does your daughter not join us for the meal? My daughter leads her life like a cat. An untamed one, may I add. And especially with this visit, I think she feels there would be less strain with her absence. Mark is my cousin, doctor. He knows Melinda did not choose to marry me. Does he also know that I was against the marriage? No, sir. Well, I ask why my cousin comes of a long and honorable line and his wealth and position are secure. I know no finer man. I will not speak for Melinda. For myself. I write it off to the fact that no one else has a better grasp of my work. And I'm selfish enough to want to hold on to her just a few more years. Why just a few? Have you so little time left? My death is written in the stars. I'm not as selfish as you might think. But I am close, so close to the elixir of life that I hope I do not lose her help till that moment is here. And you will hold her till then? I will try. The end is all. At my age, I'm less concerned with ends than with beginnings. My remark in itself might have seemed harmless enough. But the professor or doctor was super sensitive to underlying meanings. And those searching eyes turned on me as if they could search out the uttermost meaning of my soul. I felt for a moment as though a ghost had crept across my grave. Thank 
thank you for your hospitality, sir. Uh, you are welcome, sir. I apologize only for having no household staff. All my slender resources go into my experiments. Uh, that's why I had to ask Bruce to go fetch your horses. I should have gone with him. I lingered only in the hope of bidding good evening to the Lady Melchior. And I held you only to suggest that you forget Melinda. I'm afraid that would be an impossibility, Doctor. Uh, I was afraid of that. You object if I try to call on her? I doubt if it would do any good. But my daughter is her own mistress. I can only caution you caution that... Caution is for old men, Father, not for the young. Still, I am here in its name. What do you mean? The mist lies like a blanket on the moor. Even Bruce, as well as he knows the way, could not find it to the town, let alone some ark. I have made up beds for both of them. They must stay and be our guests. For myself, I accept gladly. But perhaps Dr. Melchior... No, 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 no. Melinda is right. It's as dark as a witch's pocket abroad. And unseasonably cold for these old bones. And besides... And who am I to stand in the way of fate? Go in, Father, dear. I shall see our guests settled and safe. Settled? But uh, safe? God's will be done. I shall see you in the morning. Good night, Father. Good night, Dr. Melchior. Well, Sir Mark, shall we walk together to the stables and tell Bruce he need not saddle the horses? Or to the end of the earth. And beyond. Or to the end of the earth. And beyond. But we should tell Bruce. Of course. If you'll lend me your hand to lead me the way. Come. It's beyond all reason. Wild, improbable. But since I first saw you take your horse across that stone wall... <laughs> There's a gap in it not three feet away from where I went over, but I wanted to be sure you noticed me. How could I have missed you? Bruce might have wanted you to. I know about you and Bruce. But there never was anyone more honest and true-hearted, and he loves me like a brother. I think it would be very hard for anyone not to love you. <laughs> Even you. It's scarcely seemly for the maid to make the first declaration. Does it have to be? Put in words. The moment our eyes crossed, you knew. I love you from the present dark to tomorrow's dawn. And all tomorrows. From this first moment to the last. To the grave and beyond. You don't even know me. And teach me to learn. It will not be hard. For I love you the same. Say the words, the actual words that bind us. Forever. Will you love and protect me and never let me go, Mark? You know I will. Oh, I want time to stand still. I won't grow old. It will for us. You never will for me. Even if we're parted. We won't be. But should we be? I'd kill myself. No. No, never. I won't allow you to harm yourself. Just never stop loving me. Never. Promise me that. And I can never truly die. I promise you. And you will not die. We were married. And lived six months in such a state of bliss and absolute love that... Not one solitary thing, not even a vagrant thought of any world beyond us intruded on our paradise. And then, one day, out riding. I think your love is cooling. It needs reviving. Remember the first day you saw me? You were down the blade! Before I could move... She clapped spur to her horse and headed for a high stone wall. The approach was too short and the horse could not clear the wall. His front legs crashed knee high against the stone and the horse and rider catapulted head over heels among a shower of rocks. 
By the time I got to Melinda, she was dead. No goodbye, just gone like a snuffed-out candle. Dead. Up a broken neck. Father-in-law, in God's name. I've been waiting for you, my son. I know. You are the alchemist. Your elixir of life. Another six months. But I have not yet found the key. We're both to blame for her death. You knew it was coming? If I had known for sure. Uh, but second sight is not infallible. And I wanted her happiness even above my mission in life. We both gambled and lost. Or perhaps I should say, all three of us. Isn't there some hope that your elixir... For centuries, that has remained a dream. Melinda is in the grave forever. No. No, I'll never accept that. I'll find a way. We cannot fly in the face of God, my son. From this day forth, because of what he has taken from me, I renounce him. And I damn him to take his place with Lucifer and all the other fallen angels. How easily in the heat of passion, of the agony of loss, the thoughtless words spring to our lips. How fortunate we are that so seldom are we held to account for them. But the Baron Mark Staunton was not to escape so easily. Nor his unwilling partner, Dr. Cadmus Melchior as we shall see when I return shortly with Act Two. Time, they say, heals all wounds, particularly if one is in the early 20s. And loneliness was far from Baron Mark Staunton's natural estate. Indeed, the extent of his physical estate made it incumbent on him to be married and to produce heirs who would maintain the line. And so, within the year, he had married well, unlike his cousin Bruce, still a bachelor. Darling, why so pensive? Oh, oh I was just thinking of poor lonely Bruce. I swear he enjoys our children more almost than we do. I hope that isn't so with you. It certainly isn't with me, Mark. Oh, Anne, my lovely wife and mother. No man could ask for a fuller, richer life than I have. You find me a satisfactory wife? You have all the love I have to give. Why should you question it? It's foolish, I know, but... every time Bruce comes to visit... What? Oh, I'm ashamed of myself, really. It brings her to mind. And I ask God to forgive me for what I feel about a young girl who met a sad death so early. We have never talked about... about my first wife before. I must be growing older or more secure. Ah, oh, but I do love you so. Which makes us a pair of doves. Thank you, my love. And now I must go up to the children's room and be a bear. I know how they adore their Uncle Bruce. But he does get them so excited with his games and fun, and I can never get them off to sleep. I'll send him down. As I step to the fire to stir it up, somehow that simple exchange between a comfortably married man and wife had evoked another picture. That wild, tempestuous, selfish passion of seven years ago from the glowing embers, the face of Melinda, dark eyes ablaze, hair flying in the wind. The face I had so long forced out of my mind suddenly faced me, accusing me, reminding me of all the irrevocable promises made in the heat of youth. I was glad to be interrupted as Bruce came to join me. You lucky old sinner. Two wives and kids like that. What? What's the matter? What ails you? Oh, memories. More and more they haunt me. First, it was only in my dreams, but now they invade my waking hours. What are you talking about? Melinda. What else? 
All those years ago and still not out of your mind. Is she out of yours? Bruce, how... How would you like a... A visitor by month's end? You? Well, you know my hunting lodge is too small. Just your old hunting companion. And the grouse season is at its height. Anne and the children go to visit Milady and Earl, and I would go to greater lengths to miss that dull, dreary household. That's not fair to Anne. Oh, not Anne, bless her. She's been the finest of wives and mothers, just her, her kin. Ah, oh, for the sake of old ties and friendship, Bruce, free me for once from this deadly annual visit or part of it. Invite me, when Anne returns, to shoot with you over old grounds. A man's retreat to his own company. Well, it would be good to ride along with you again across the moors. Selfishly, I would welcome the visit. <laughs> Why would you miss me so much? Every second of every minute of every hour of every day. That's all. My gentle, kind, and loving Anne. Shall we split the difference? Two weeks away from your mother's patronizing me and your father's cold dislike. I'm sorry about my parents. <laughs> you more than I. You've had to suffer them all your life. I know how much you've taken from them, and I hate going just as much as you. I go only for the children's sake, and because I owe them some respect. But I don't blame you for not wanting to be there. So go with Bruce, and be free for a little while. But meet me halfway, just two weeks. I may be longing for all three of you before that in return. Oh, I hope so. At least that you miss us. And no ghosts will haunt you from the past. Ghosts? Well, didn't... Didn't your first wife come from nearby Bruce's lodge? She did. And after six years under the ground, she is surely dead enough. And you know me well enough... By now, to know I hold no traffic in ghosts. And so I went with Bruce back into the past. Did I really believe it had no hold on me? Was the tomb I had built in the darkest recesses of my heart from Melinda total recognition of her death? Or did some irrational hope still burn like a flame? First night at Bruce's hunting lodge, we drank more than we should have and stayed up far too late. It was the darkest hour before the dawn when I was awakened by... Huh? Oh, go Oh, where? Uh, oh, sleep. Uh. Mark! Mark! You have come back. Melinda. Look, Melinda. Look to the window. Melinda, as you were. As I could be. It's the seventh year. And three nights from now, the moon is new. Go to my father. Make him bring me back. No. Melinda, let me talk to you now. Melinda! What's going on? Melinda. Hmm? She, she was there just beyond the window. I could see her. Oh, you're as drunk as I am. Nobody outside that window. It's 30 feet to the <laughs> uh, There'll be no hunting tomorrow. We're due for heavy rain. Oh, oh my head is splitting. Let's both go to bed and sleep off our carousings. I shall ask for nothing better than that. But whatever sleep I had was fitful because, as Bruce had predicted, the rain came slanting down and the black clouds lay so low across the moors a man might have reached and touched them from the back of a tall horse. At last, I could stand it no longer. I had to face the magnet which had drawn me back to my past. I looked in on my snoring cousin, breakfasted on black bread and brandy, and sat being my horse. Rode for the alchemist's isolated home. Suddenly, it was seven years ago, and I almost expected Melinda to appear out of the fog. Hmm. 
Yes. Who is it? You don't recognize your own flesh and blood? All I have ever had of flesh and blood has lain moldering in the grave for seven years. I'm not so close then, I admit. But I was your daughter's husband. What? Why should you return at this particular moment? Oh, for first, come in, come in. It is foul weather. And chill enough in here. Uh, alone, I cannot tend the fires and watch my experiments. <laughs> uh, what brings you here? Melinda. You are married with a wife and children. What does Melinda mean to you anymore? My heart, my soul, my only real reason for being. What I was died with her. What I am is a dream I live. A dream no longer worth living. Especially after last night. Come. Come to my laboratory. It's the only place where there is warmth. Uh, what do you mean by especially last night? I saw her. Where? Outside my window. It's a Bruce Hayward's lodge. The sleeping quarters are on the second floor. It was but a dream. I tell you, she or her spirit was there. She sent me here with a message. What message? That this was the seventh year. And in three nights, the moon is new. She bade me tell you, bring her back. No. No. I cannot listen to her plea. Why not? What do you know of science, any of you? The weary hours, the years of failure, and the curse of failing hope. The need for direct experiment and the lack of subjects to try it on. And beyond and deeper than that, the right... Whether man has the right to meddle in the affairs of God. That means you have found the elixir. I didn't say that. You must be close. Close, yes. Close. And little hope of being closer. My age. And there is no more money. Why not try it on yourself? <laughs> How do you suppose I have existed these past years? On the elixir? One person doesn't create proof. I can make so little. But I think it has sustained me. Then can't it do the same for Melinda? Oh, that is so different. She has been dead for seven years. But you can raise her from the grave. You must. Uh, reflect on one thing. If she could be brought back from the beyond, you are hers forever. Be aware now that if I could bring Melinda back, you would never be rid of her. This marriage would be for eternity, forever, till the graves all open wide and the dead revive on Judgment Day. What you are risking here is your immortal soul. If I must, I must. So be it. The time will never be more advantageous. Meet me alone by the gallows tree, and I will transport you from there to the grave where Melinda waits for you. And me. But I warn you, if you value your life, do not keep our appointment. Do not try to wake the dead. A woman moldering to dust in the fetid earth to be brought back to life? And if his first wife lives again, what happens to Mark's second? And his children? And most of all, himself? Could he live with both? Or must he make a choice? Will he be allowed a choice? In attempting to give life to Melinda, is he perhaps signing his own death warrant? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. (laughs) 
It was the poet Swinburne who said, We thank with brief thanksgiving whatever gods may be, that no man lives forever, and dead men rise up never. Certainly all of us could subscribe to that and believe in it. And yet we could oppose that other famous quotation from Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Let's see which proves more apt this time in this tale. For two days I tried to find another world to escape to, but no amount of wine or liquor dulled my thoughts or dampened my hope. Fortunately, it had the opposite effect on Bruce, and so when I left on the night of the new moon for my rendezvous with the alchemist, he was out as if he'd been clubbed. Mark? Yes, doctor. You are alone? Yes. Then follow me to the graveyard. Will, will the rain make any difference? There will be no rain there. We are expecting it. The old man was right. From the moment we left the gallows tree, the rain had stopped. And high above the scudding clouds, the fingernail of the brand new moon appeared and disappeared as if pointing straight at us. Come with me to the grave. For the last time, I warn you, wake not the dead. Let her rest. I let her rest. But upon me... Reflect. She is six years dead. Who knows what awesome creature of loathing I am to resurrect? Then if it be so, I will join her now. It shall be as you wish. Step back. Soto, thou the savior. As I step oh, back. I took the sorcerer's stick and drew three circles about the tomb. As he traced them, he muttered words of enchantment as he completed the third circle with a great flash of lightning. The stone rolled from the grave. And the coffin was revealed. Bats and owls rushed by. A rushing wind blew the earth, scattering the mold before it. And of a sudden, with a rending sound... The coffin lid burst open as the moonbeams streamed as bright as if it were the full. And from the skull which Cadmus had filled with the smoking liquid, he poured the elixir on the grave, crying, The heart beats once more with the flood of life. Thine eye is open to sight. Arise, Melinda, from the tomb. And suddenly, rising from the rotting wood as fresh as though it had been yesterday, pale and cold from her long sleep with the black eyes flashing, and that glorious black hair tumbling about her shoulders was my Melinda, alive and breathing. Thank you, my beloved doctor, for restoring her to me. My last act, my last warning... We should have left the dead in peace. May God forgive me. A flood of torrential rain made anything but emergency action possible. I had scarce time to fold my chill and lovely bride in my arms before we had to drag her father to the tomb she had so recently risen from. Together we rolled the stone back into place. Melinda mounted my horse while I took the old man's. Darling, we'll ride to Bruce's lodge and warm you. No, Mark, please. I want to go home. In this weather, chilled as you are already. My blood flows warmer every minute. And a longer ride will warm and bring me back to full life again. Is there any reason why we can't go home? No reason in the world. Beloved, you're so cold, so so cold. 
How could you expect the chill of the grave to melt so soon? Shall I take you to my bed and warm you with my body? Too soon for that. You're not my husband anymore. I am your lover. Who broke your pledge to me. Remember. Oh, Melinda, I... You left me to rot in the grave. I begged your father to try the elixir to raise you again. He said it was not ready. He told me he had foreseen your death if you married me. He felt it was God's will. So you married another woman. And with her you conceived the children who might have been mine. I did all that. But it was I who drove your father into bringing you back. And now? Anne and... And the children will not be back for three weeks. We have all that time together to renew our love. For three weeks? And then? Well, we, we will come to some arrangement, some place for you to stay, or part of the castle, or, or and back with her parents, whatever works best. No! I want that woman out of my life. Divorce. That would be next to impossible. The bishop I'm not ne- interested in divorce. You will be all mine, or there is nothing between us. She would have to die before she... Before she'd give you up. Then let her die. Her time has come. There is only one way for me, as what I was, and will forever be, your wife. Alone. I was warned. I should have known, admitted it, and I was trapped. I loaded my pistols and mounting my horse rode for my father-in-law's house and Anne. I had no clear idea of what my intent was. I was mad, of course, and possessed. I had to have Melinda no matter the cost. And Anne was in the way. At her father's castle, I found Anne in the turret. It was a mild evening with a soft wind blowing, and I didn't know what I would have to do after I'd explained it to her, like everything else in our life. She resolved it. Hear the gulls cry in the distance, Mark. So strident when they are near. So mournful, far away. It's like a sound I've heard faintly in my heart ever since we married. I gave you all the love I had to give. You said that once before. I should have read it more clearly. I thought Melinda could be forgotten. <laughs> Vain thought now. Oh, and what can I say? Say? There's nothing to be said. What can you do? That's more to the point, isn't it? There are no half ways. And divorce would never be recognized. So what? Shall you shoot me? No, no. I wouldn't want to force you to do that. I used to come up here when I was a little girl. And I would think, how lovely if I could step from this turret, spread my skirts, and fly. Fly like the seagulls, skimming downward to the sea. Because I love you, you see. Go fast, for no one knows you're here. Take care of the children. Hey. No! Goodbye. I love you. She was gone before I could reach her. Her skirt spreading like wings, but too weak to hold her up against the crags below. How long do you decently mourn a wife? Certainly more than... Three short weeks. But Melinda could not shake her chill. And the roses, once so bright in her cheeks, seemed fading, and the luster of her air and eyes dimming. To have her in my bed, she must be my wife, and I felt that only I could bring her life again. To save her anything was worth it. The censure of my neighbors, the sullen resistance from my servants, even the disgust for my old friend Bruce. I'm as mad as you are to stand up with you at this wedding. I cannot live without her, Bruce. Was there ever such a wedding? At least don't take your pistols to the altar. I carry them everywhere I go. No one believes I did not push Anne to her death. There is no one, perhaps save you, who would not like to see me dead. You and Melinda. Oh, God... 
look at her in that white veil and pure white dress. Was anything ever lovelier? I was drunk with love and undeserved happiness. The ceremony went by in a daze until at last I turned to put a ring on her finger. In sick horror, I gazed at her hand. A skeleton's hand. The jointed bones with their shreds of desiccated flesh disintegrating in my hand. With a cry of agony, I stepped back and whipped the veil away from her face. Two socketless eyes looked blindly at me from the crumbling skull. Then... Slowly, her whole frame collapsed inside the beaded dress to a pitiful heap of empty silk. Melinda was gone. And there was only one way I could join her. Mark! Take care of the children. It, it was all foretold. The alchemist knew only way... Melinda and I can be with each other. It was Cadmus Melchior the alchemist who knew it as a philosopher and yet was as weak as Mark who was only a man who loved too well. We cannot fly in the face of God and I warn you do not try to wake the dead. Such is the story of the spectral bride. I'll be back shortly. I don't know at what hour you heard this story or what season of the year. For me, whenever I tell it, even on a summer's evening... Some hint of old age always creeps into my bones. The fingertips chill, and my wife complains of cold feet. Mine. It does chill the blood. No doubt of it. And I hope it isn't true. Our cast included Michael Wager, Joan Loring, Patricia Elliott, Robert Dryden, and Jordan Charney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You'll help, George. I've always helped him. I'll still help him after I'm dead. What? Oh, what? Mrs. Loomis, you, you must leave now. After I'm dead, I'll come back for George. Mrs. Loomis. Yes, yes. Goodbye. Walter, goodbye for now. Doctor? I'm I'm sorry, but there isn't a chance in the world. He can hang on for minutes, days, but we can't save him. But I was just talking to him. You heard. I heard nothing. He, he wasn't saying anything. But I heard him. I heard him. Mrs. Loomis, it's... It's just your imagination... Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>